good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you all for tuning in. My name is Alexandra O'Hara. I'm the National Director for Catechetics. And on behalf of the Council for Catechetics of the Irish Episcopal Conference and Veritas, you're all most welcome to the first in this webinar series. Together along the way, conversations on Catholic faith formation in contemporary Ireland. This webinar series organized by the Council for Catechetics and Veritas aims to bring together leading theologians, religious educators and catechists to explore new avenues for Catholic faith formation in contemporary Ireland. Inspired by the new directory for catechesis published by the Pontifical Council for Promoting New Evangelization in 2020. In the large, diverse and complex religious education landscape, Directories for catechesis functioned as atlases that guide educators and faith communities. However, we need leaders and visionaries who help us to interpret, it, interpret those atlases and read the maps they contain. In the run-up to the National Synod in Ireland, we hope that this webinar series will serve to animate and inspire religious educators, teachers, pastoral leaders, evangelizers, and anyone else interested in sharing the best of the Catholic tradition with creativity and conviction. And just to note that this is a public forum and we will be recording this webinar. I'm honored to welcome our first speaker in the series, Father Billy Swan, a priest of the Diocese of Ferns. Father Billy was ordained in 1998. He served for four years as an associate pastor before further studies in Rome where he was awarded a licentiate and doctorate in systematic theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University. And he served for four years as a director of seminary formation at the Pontifical Irish College in Rome. He is currently administrator of Wexford Parish. Billy has a deep interest in the relationship between faith and science, the new evangelization, early Irish Christianity and priestly formation. And he's the author of four books, Creed of Love, published by Veritas in 20, uh, 2006, The Experience of God in the Writings of St. Patrick, Apostle of Ireland, um, Billy's doc doctoral uh, work published by the Gregorian University in Pre Press in 2013, uh, Faith and Mental Health, uh, published by the Catholic Truth Society in 2020, and Love as a Source, uh, published by St. Paul's in London in, also in 2020. And he is the founder of the Hook of Faith website and a frequent contributor to Bishop Robert Barron's Word on Fire, which is at wordonfire.org. Uh, so Father Billy will speak to us this evening on a faith that grows through pain, P-A-N-E. Uh, Billy, uh, you're very welcome. Um, and uh, you, you might uh, just open with, with a prayer. I was thinking that the, the synod prayer we could... Uh, we could pray that. We ask the Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us in our conversation here this evening, uh, among us as friends and among us as fellow brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus and children of God our Father. As we pray, we stand before you, Holy Spirit, as we gather together in your name, with you alone to guide us, make yourself at home in our hearts. Teach us the way we must go and how we are to pursue it. We are weak and sinful. Do not let us promote disorder. Do not let ignorance lead us down the wrong path, nor partiality influence our actions. Let us find in you our unity so that we may journey together to eternal life and not stray from the way of truth and what is right. All this we ask of you who are at work in every place and time in the communion of the Father and the Son forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so good evening, everybody. Good evening, Father. Thank you for coming and joining us in this evening. I'm honored and privileged to have been asked and invited by uh, Alex to be the first speaker in this series of talks uh, organized by the Council for Catechesis of the Irish Episcopal Conference. 
And um, I'm conscious as I was writing the date of this talk that it's the 22nd of the 2nd, 2022. And I'm told reliably that it's called, the date is a palindrome and an ambigram. And what that means is that it, it, it reads the same uh, forwards as backwards, and it also reads the same upside down as the right way up. So uh, maybe that's hopefully that's a good omen. So it's a unique day. And I'm very, very honored to, to uh, initiate this conversation about the nature and about the gift of faith. Before I begin, I'd also like to compliment uh, Alex and his whole team there in the Council for Catechesis on the launch of the Credible Catholic Program. I had a, a, a look at, at the program and I think it's wonderful. I think it's a fantastic resource that draws on the substantial intellectual tradition of the Catholic faith to meet the challenges of our time. Um, I heard recently uh, a phrase, uh, you know, uh, something that struck me as being true that uh, aggressive intellectual atheists, while we are trying to hug people into the church, these new atheists are arguing people out of it. And the atheists are winning every time. And I, that, that, uh, perspective struck me as something that's been true that <clears throat> there is an intellectual tradition in our uh, faith that we underappreciate. Jesus asked us to love our Lord, the Lord our God, with all our hearts, with all our minds, and with all our strengths. But He asked us to love God with our minds. This is not to say that we reduce the Christian faith to uh, intellect or to a kind of reinvented Gnosticism in our contemporary time and in our modern day. But what it does mean is that the intellectual tradition of the church, drawing from the wonderful insights of people like Augustine, of people like Therese of uh, Avila, Therese of Lisieux, John of the Cross, St. John Paul II, Edith Stein, um, to name but a few of the great minds and uh, saints that are part of our Catholic tradition. And the great insights, the way they grasped and grappled with the great questions of our time that haven't gone away, that really re-emerge in our own time in different guises and different colors. So I, I commend the work of the Council for Catechesis um, to really um, honour and respect the intellectual tradition of Catholic Christianity. And there's a line in the Gospels that says, the wise person is the one who brings out from their storeroom things both old and new. And for me, the intellectual tradition of the church is like that storeroom. It is big enough and broad enough and deep enough to contain uh, gems of wisdom and insights from our tradition that need to be drawn upon and, if you like, freshened up in order to preach the gospel in a compelling way in the modern day in which we live and to engage in modern culture. So I'm really delighted with that. I'd really like to congratulate everybody involved in the Credible Catholic Program. So on now to the, to the, the task of, of the topic of this evening, which is the... Um, the uh, new catechesis, the directory for catechesis. So you see it there. Uh, I've just finished reading it and I have been very impressed by it. It is a, a fresher, uh, a freshening up of the, this uh, document that was also very, very impressive. It's a general directory for catechesis published by the Congregation for the Clergy, published in 1998. I remember the first time I read this, I've been blown away by how comprehensive, how a wonderful a document uh, it is and was for the framework for catechesis in the church at the time. This modern directory is published by the Pontifical Council for promoting the new evangelization. So there's a different uh, emphasis, there's a different scope on this modern document that was published in 2021. And uh, it is again, very impressive. It takes on board uh, the seminal documents that Pope Francis wrote of the joy of the gospel, um, rejoice and be glad, it, it, it draws on the pivotal and fundamental points and um, pillars 
of catechesis and faith formation that Francis highlights in that document. Um, so for, for all of us who are committed to the work of evangelization, this document is essential reading, I would argue. And what impressed me most about the document was the close connection held throughout the chapters of the, of the, of the book between evangelization, being at the service of faith, and how faith leads to loving communion with God. So it, it is how the charisma, how the proclamation of the good news with vigor, with conviction, and with faith is at the service of faith itself. And been at the service of, of how faith leads us to loving communion with the Holy Trinity. It says in two pivotal chapters, 75 and 426, and I quote, at the center of every process of catechesis is the living encounter with Christ. Communion with Christ Jesus, who died and rose again, who is living and always present, is the ultimate end of all ecclesial action and therefore of catechesis as well. So it reminds us of the line from the Gospel of John that all of these things were recorded so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. So everything in John's gospel for him was at the service of faith. Um, so the proclamation of Christ crucified and risen was at the service of people coming to faith in the Lord Jesus. So that uh, focus on living faith is a theme that is emphasized and is retained throughout the whole document. So here is the goal of it all for us as evangelizers and, and catechists. Here is the result that we evangelizers want to see, the prize on which our hearts are set, that everyone comes to know and love Christ Jesus, to believe in him, and thus to share in the life of God. And here in this article, or here in this talk, I would like to draw attention to what the directory advises regarding how efforts to evangelize can more effectively lead to a growth in faith in those we engage with. So again, friends, just to put this before us, that the purpose of our proclamation, the purpose of our catechesis, the purpose of our witness, the purpose of our prayer as Christians is to lead others to faith in Jesus Christ and therefore into an intimate relationship into the life of God. In one chapter of the Directory for Catechesis, entitled Catechesis in the Lives of Persons, the directory outlines four particular tasks of catechesis with adults that are focused on the goal of moving people towards a response of faith or leading people who already believe into a deeper, more mature faith. And these four tasks are the task of purification, the task of assisting faith to grow, the task of nourish, nourishing faith as it grows, and finally, the catechesis that it, ser it serves to elicit faith, fostering a new beginning of faith-filled experience. So that's where the acronym, a faith that goes through pain, comes from. It's a little bit of a play on the word. Um, but hopefully you begin to see what it is about as I go along. <coughs> that faith grows through pain, of course. It goes through certain growing pains. Um, it grows through a time of trial and suffering and expansion. Um, for God is calling us into a new way of being, into a transforming existence, transformed existence. But pain as an acronym for purification, assistance, nourishment, and to elicit faith as a faith response. So I'm going to go through each of those four pillars that hopefully you will find useful. First of all, a purification of faith from what the directory calls partial, misguided, or erroneous religious presentations. Now, just as an example, this brought to mind um, a memory of a good priest that I used to know from my youth, who had a number of pet peeves and favorite topics. No matter what the readings at mass were, 
or whatever the liturgical occasion was, these peeves and, and emphasis would come into the homily. And I think that here too, of how easy it can be for all of us to make God into our own image and likeness and to make him a projection of our own desires. Um, Alex talked there at the beginning, I write regularly, in actual fact, I have an article today on the Word on Fire uh, website and Word on Fire blog, um, in which you talk about the chair of St. Peter. But um, in a recent talk that Bishop Robert Barron gave, he's an auxiliary bishop with the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, he gave a talk in which he said that the new atheists, their arguments against God always rebel against what is a false image of God. And he drew from the writings and the teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas uh, to make his point. In other words, the new atheists, they reject an image of God that we should reject as well. They reject an image of God that is not the God revealed by Jesus Christ in the scriptures. Um, and how the new atheists challenge us to purify our image of God. And like I said about the priest um, who was always, you know, working into his humbly a message that wasn't actually in the scriptures on a given Sunday um, or a projection of his own hangups or whatever it might be. It's so important for us as priests and catechists to be faithful to um, the objectivity of the Christian faith that we have inherited. Not that there's any room for creativity or expansion or faith development. St. John Henry Newman insisted that there is, of course. But at the same time, we know how easy it is for us to project uh, God or an image of God uh, and how we can make God a projection of our own desires and a projection of how we wish God to be. And that's why it's so important for us to take us back to the witness and the word of Jesus himself, who came to reveal a God that is bigger than any box we might make for him. <clears throat> so this is really important for us, friends, that we stick to the God that Jesus revealed the Father to be. And this first task of purification calls evangelizers and catechists and teachers of the faith to have a clear objectivity about the faith we teach and share. Another guy I follow on social media and online is a young American convert called Brandon Bott. He has this uh, website called Claritas um, that uh, suggests clarity. But in actual fact, Claritas uh, is the Latin word for luminosity, which is connected to clarity. But he makes the very valid point that for us as catechists today, that confusion does not serve our purposes very well. Um, confusion was the strategy of the evil one in the Garden of Eden. But what serves us is clarity and that the more clear we are at our, about our faith, the more confident we will be in sharing it and witnessing it and talking about it in the classroom, in the home, around the kitchen table, um, in the pulpit, at the altar, wherever it might be. Clarity breeds confidence. And the more clear we are about what we believe, the more confident that we will become. So this, this, this is a task is incumbent on all of us to have a clear objectivity about the faith we teach and we share. It's not just my faith, but our faith. The faith is the faith of the apostolic church that has been handed down to us and that we are asked to proclaim in fidelity to the word of God, to the living tradition of the church and the authentic interpretation of that word by the church's magisterium. In practical terms, this means constant and prayerful recourse to the scriptures and the catechism. <clears throat> that both evangelize us and prepare us to prepare us to evangelize others. And this is why it's so important, even as priests, and my own experience as a priest, to listen attentively to the word of God before I ever dare to preach it. Um, I heard it said with good reason that some priests, before they preach, 
um, they prepare a homily, but other priests prepare themselves. And it's so easy to prepare yourself. How do you prepare yourself? By sitting prayerfully with the word of God that the church is commissioned you to preach, to share. And the importance of listening to that word yourself before you dare to share it with others. I once heard a bishop uh, share with us in a priest retreat. He said, let me listen to a priest preach for five minutes and I will tell you whether or not he prays. I thought it was a fantastic insight because if the priest has not prayed, we, it doesn't come through the heart. It's not, what we say is not coming from a place of deep holiness and authenticity. And people will pick it, will pick it up a mile away. And the effectiveness of the word that we preach will be dulled and blunted. So the important friend, the importance, friends, of uh, listening and making the word of God our own and to really listen to what it says rather than what we wanted to say. So that's the first principle of purification. The second principle, the A in the acronym of pain, is assistance or to assist the sharing and the witness of faith preparing spaces of sharing and service in the church and in the world as ways of realizing the task of manifesting the kingdom of God. And I've quoted that sentence from the directory for catechesis itself. To assist the sharing and witness of faith, preparing spaces of sharing and service in the church and in the world as ways of realizing the task of manifesting the kingdom of God. So we need to help each other we need to help the faith to grow and the faith to be passed on we need to help faith to become credible this task reminds us that in in order for faith to grow it needs space and opportunities for expression consider for a moment the the confirmation programs in our parishes that prepare young people for the sacrament you know, we talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the ways God has gifted our youth, which is all very good and all very true. But I often ask myself um, about whether or not we create sufficient space for those young people to move into once they are confirmed in order to use and to express those gifts of the Spirit that they have received. Do parishes create enough space within those communities for those gifts to be welcomed and expressed? What is the space we are confirming them into? Do our parishes have some kind of graduate system whereby young adults can assume more responsible ministries in our parishes as they mature and move further into adulthood? This task also challenges our communities to become spaces where there are opportunities to share what our faith means to us and share reasons why believing is sometimes difficult. When I was in Rome as a postgraduate, I did some work at the weekends in neocatechumenous communities. And I could say more about that experience, but what one great positive experience was the uh, opportunity that the Neocatechumenist way affords lay people and catechists to engage meaningfully with the Word of God. There was a dialogue with the Word of God that was incorporated into the celebration of the Eucharist. And I found that very, very enriching. And um, I think that, you know, when it comes to the synodal pathway and our synodal process, it mirrors that what is possible and the opportunities that present themselves in going forward. So for example, if I can use this analogy, if I was to gather with six lay people here in Wexford Parish, if we sat down together for an hour to discuss and to debate and to share on the readings of the Sunday ahead of us, so the eighth Sunday of ordinary time, and if I listen attentively to what all of those lay people shared, and then 
A day or two later, I sat down to compose my homily. It's not that I would radically alter the message or, you know, or, or to, to water down what I would want to say or to share in the community or, or at the masses that coming Sunday. But what I do know is that what I've heard from the lay people who shared the word of God with me is that what they have shared, what they have spoken, uh, would definitely shape the words and the tone and the message that I as a priest would share, would, would compose that homily in a way that I believe would make my preaching more effective and reach them in a meaningful, a more meaningful way and would really, uh, you know, anoint the hearts of those who would hear the word of God that passed through my lips and through my heart. And um, that is what I really believe. So all the more reason, friends, to welcome, to create those spaces in our parishes, in our communities and in our classrooms, whereby faith is engaged with and faith is talked about. And also the difficulties and obstacles of faith are acknowledged. Um, it involves us talking about faith, listening to the witness of faith and seeing the witness to faith by other believers. Creating spaces for sharing involves developing the language of faith and helping each other deal with any obstacles that are blocking <coughs> a fuller ascent to belief. I think here of one of, of my one of my heroes, uh, C.S. Lewis, how he came to faith or moved from, first of all, atheism to agnosticism and then agnosticism to full blown Christianity, how he was progressed on that journey mediated by hours of chat, laughter, and lively conversation with his fellow inklings in Oxford and in Cambridge, among them J.R.R. Tolkien. So what God has revealed calls for a response of our part, and so begins a dialogue that leads to a relationship that leads to faith. And so concludes that just reflection on the second pillar um, of faith development, which is assistance, that we all need to help each other to um, affirm our faith, to encourage our faith, and also to assist faith to grow. The third pillar, or the third letter in the acronym of pain, is to nurture faith or nourish faith. <coughs> it must be nourished, in the words of the directory, thanks in our part, thanks in part to an experience of meaningful ecclesial relationships, promoting the formation of mature Christian consciences, capable of giving the reason for their hope and ready to, for, a serene, for a serene and intelligent dialogue with contemporary culture. So I'm reminded of in those words of 1 Peter 3.15, where it asks the early Christians who were in exile in Asia Minor and were living in a, a surrounding culture that was alien from Christianity, he said, always be ready for an answer when people ask you a reason for the hope that you have. So as part of that response, Peter knew that the faith of Christians in Christ needed to be nurtured and to be nourished. And this is so important for Catholic Christians here today as well. In the Gospels, faith has an organic quality to it. It's not something we do or don't have. It's not that, you know, false binary. And we all know that faith is something that is alive, it's active, we can have more or less of it. It can live, it can grow, or else it can weaken, and it can also die. In the words of the directory, faith grows when it is consolidated with the years, developed with time, and deepened with age. I love that. So one of the difficulties we know we face as an Irish church is that um, people's faith has not developed sufficiently beyond their childhood catechesis. They have grown in their knowledge of many other professional areas of life, but that, that, that their faith development has lagged behind um, their development in, in, in adult in adulthood, and they are at a loss to know how 
their childhood faith can speak to their adult life experiences. Um, but I'm really hopeful and excited that we're moving into a time in the Irish church when we can help people to discover, perhaps for the first time, and in the case of others, to rediscover the invaluable resource that our Catholic faith is to face and to engage with many of the existential questions of life that life throws at us, the meaning of life, the meaning of death. What has God made me for? Why am I here? What is my purpose? What is my, is my deeper vocation? So I believe that our faith has the resourcefulness within itself to help people to find answers to these deeper questions. Faith, as we know, is something that grows or dies depending on how it is nourished and lived. In the Gospels, Jesus often, liken, often likens the gift of faith to a mustard seed. It begins small, but can grow to such a degree that others benefit from it, like birds in the branches of a tree that began its life as a small seed. Our faith in Christ is something, as Hebrews reminds us, that is alive and active. It is a gift that is nourished by the word of God and by the example of good Christians who confirm our deepest faith instincts. It is a gift that grows best in community where we make friends who encourage us to live the demands of the gospel. This is why peer support is so important in a group like this, all of us gathered here this evening. Whatever role or vocation we have in life, whether it's a catechist or a lay person, single, married, widowed or divorced or priest or deacon or whoever it might be, we encourage other, each other to live the demands of the gospel. And we encourage each other to see that having faith today is a reasonable option uh, to have as a response to a world in which we live that does not explain itself. It does not explain itself. So therefore, having faith in a creator, loving father is a reasonable response, I believe, to the world in which we live. And that people are hungry for credibility of the faith. People are, would love to believe if only they were assisted and nurtured to do so. And as the directory suggests, our consciences are always being formed and nourishing our faith leads to a clearer sense of what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is false, and what is temporary and what is everlasting. So the importance, friends, of nourishing our faith, not taking it for granted, not taking it as a once-off and as a given, because faith is fragile and it needs to be used. It's like a muscle of the body. If we don't use it, it gets weaker. If we do use it, it remains healthy, strong, and alive. And that is why the discipline of daily prayer, for example, is so important. I think it was in the gospel yesterday where the young man of the, of the, the, the father of the young man who was possessed by an evil spirit in Mark chapter 9, he said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That ought to be our prayer too. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Help me grow in the faith that I have. Finally, friends, the last letter of the acronym of PALE is to elicit a faith response. Evangelization and the work of catechesis, they seek to elicit faith by, and I quote, fostering a new beginning of, faith -filled, of a faith-filled experience. So again, that faith has an eternally new quality about it that my faith response, there's no more important faith response that God is looking for than the one I give today. Not tomorrow, not yesterday, this very moment. For the inspired preacher and teacher of the gospel, this implies a constant invitation to make a fresh response of faith and helping others to see that believing today in a creator and loving God is a reasonable option. At times, we might, might not fully understand all that faith requires of us, but the invitation to faith summons us to make that leap 
Because in the words of St. Paul, I know who it is in whom I place my trust. In that spirit, believing is a daily adventure and always begins afresh in Christ, who sends us on mission to new places and to new people. I was struck by the document as well of how, um, particularly in the joy of the gospel, Pope Francis talked about uh, how faith uh, grows through the via pulchritudinis, the way of beauty, how faith in Christ is something that we're drawn to, that we're not forced into, but that's something that has an inherent beauty and a quality to it that attracts all that the human heart believes in and all that the human heart loves and values at its deepest center. And this is why to elicit the gift of faith and the response of faith is so important as well. And I don't think we talk about this often enough, you know, um, about how God, how about belief in God is beautiful, how God is beautiful, how he is goodness itself, how he is beauty itself, and how he is truth itself. And this is another important aspect of faith as well, that we're drawn towards truth. The mind doesn't want part of the truth. It wants all of the truth. It wants to know what is true in order to become free. Pretending is a form of slavery. And that is why the, the truth of the faith is attractive. People want to know, is this true or is it not? And if people discover or rediscover the truth of their faith, they will be naturally drawn to us and they will, it will elicit from them a new and a fresh faith response that is adequate for the day in which we live. Friends, for all of us, by way of conclusion, for all of us who strive to teach, to preach, and to share the good news of the gospel, may we keep in mind that faith grows through pain, P-A-N-E, through purification of our message by conversion and fidelity to God's living word, through assisting the sharing and witness to faith, through nourishment of the faith that we have, enabling it to grow every day. And finally, through eliciting the response of faith by making our own the words of the man in Mark's gospel, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. With the guidance of the new directory for catechesis, may our efforts to evangelize be driven by a burning desire to lead others to faith in Christ and to a loving union with him in heart, in mind, and in action. Amen. So friends, I've come to the end of this uh, talk, but I know there's another step or two to run. I think Alex is going to lead us into breakout rooms, um, which will facilitate group conversation. And I would just leave these, these questions with you for those um, uh, discussions. Um, and they are about the, the four pillars that I've just been talking about, purification, assisting, nourishment, and eliciting. And it's just simply, how can we purify the faith that we have in a way that makes it more authentic? In what ways can we assist each other grow in faith? In what ways can we nurture our faith? And in what way can we elicit a faith response in ourselves and each other on a daily basis? So I look forward to your um, insights, friends, um, as we uh, debate now what you've just heard. Thank, thank you very much, Father Billy, for uh, a wonderfully rich presentation and really establishing on those uh, four pillars and a very helpful acronym for, for starting this, this conversation. So. Um, I don't want this just to be a, a talk uh, uh, about these matters. Um, I want it to be a conversation and, and, and discussion. So we're just going to uh, use breakout rooms for 10 minutes um, and maybe to, to reflect on, on the questions that, that Father Billy um, has, has raised. We'll come back then after 10 minutes and uh, any questions or, or anything that, that 
um, came up in your in your groups, if you'd like to to discuss them, uh, then I could ask one. Of course. Yeah, Maybe sorry, just to, to to Father Billy there. Having read the the new directory, um, does the directory make make distinguishing or make a dis distinctions between catechetics, religious education, and evangelization? I think it does, Brennan, from my memory of having read it. Um, uh, but I will uh, take a, a look again on, on, on that question in the, in the light of what you've asked. Um, but there is an organic relationship between them all. Um, and what really struck me time and time again is how catechesis, how, how uh, proclamation and catechesis is all at the service of faith, you know, that that's what really we are about. Um, it's not teaching knowledge, it's not imparting knowledge. What we want as, as missionary disciples and evangelists is to elicit faith in people, to uh, help them to believe and to come to faith as we have come to faith as well. That we want them to share in the gift that we have discovered as being like a pearl of great price. And we don't want to keep it for ourselves. We want to, you know, it's like the disciples. We cannot remain silent about what, what we have seen and what we have heard. So that that's very strong in the whole document. And, uh, you know, that catechesis is unpacking uh, the doctrinal content of what we believe in order to nurture people in a way that is life giving. That is very strong throughout the directory. And I, lo I love that, that element of it. Yeah, yeah. If I could just ask you, Billy, that in today's world and in today's, in modern Ireland, uh, there are very few people who have, uh, who we might say are theologically literate. Uh, and, and, and there's probably a need for a kind of, uh, some people might say it's pre-evangelization, but others might say it's, it's post-evangelization, that we think we know, but in fact, we don't know. Um, where would you suggest that people should start? And I'm thinking particularly of people who are, for people who are in their 20s, you know, who've been through uh, school and who may well have had a degree in college and so on. But that that whole area of the spiritual, we were on a, a, a Zoom call last night and Father Jerry O'Handon was talking, and he was talking about uh, Sally Rooney's third book. Uh, you know, with normal people, I forget what the second one was. But he was saying the third one is about young people in their 20s and their search for God and the, and, and the whole spiritual realm and so on. And he was saying that it, it was, an, for him, he said it was an amazing experience to read that. He said he didn't understand the world that they were living in, but he said it was fascinating to see that these people, and she herself as a writer, has been gripped by this. And where is the search for the transcendent and what satisfies the hunger of the heart? I think it's a very good question, Harry. I, I think it's a not uh, it's not a one size fits all a solution. I, I think that you know I read a book lately as well from atheist to Catholic, and it's twenty stories of twenty people who moved from atheism to Catholicism. For some, it's a book that they read. For others, it's a song that they heard. For others, it was uh, reading the Catechism. Others reading the Bible. Um, for, for others, they were touched by the, 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 the mercy, the lived mercy of Catholic charities, et cetera, et cetera. So we have many strings to our bow, uh, Harry, and, and that's why I, I think the evangelization is a multifaceted uh, enterprise um, that we need to, we need to uh, utilize uh, so that it touches all of the senses and, and touches the imagination as well. The head, the heart, the hands, um, and that you know we 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 do so. We engage in it with the gifts that we have. For others, it's the gift of eloquent speaking and teaching and preaching. For others, it's the power of a life well lived. For others, it is writing. For others, it is music. So wh whatever your gifts that you have, and um, that you use them, but that all of them. Uh, our gifts and the message that we communicate are at the service of eliciting a faith response on the part of people today. That faith is a gift, but it's also something that is mediated through human beings and to fellow Christians. And I, I, here, here's another way I would say it, Harry, at the universal language of love. Um, 
And I often say this to parents who are struggling to pass on the gift of faith to their kids. You know, if you are wondering, uh, looking for different ways of passing on the faith to, the, to your children, tell them about what you love. Tell them about what you love, because if you love the mass, for example, if you love Christ, you will find the words to explain to them the reasons why you love the Lord Jesus. Um, because it begins with what you love, because you will find the words to, to, to share with what you love, but loving comes first. So evangelization as sharing what you love. I think that's a powerful lens through which we see all of the catechetical and the teaching and the proclamation work that we're engaged in. Yeah. Am I? Yes. Am I audible? Yes. Thanks. Uh, I'm just thinking that was a wonderful presentation. Thanks, here Mary. We, here we are in pre-synodal preparation time. I'd love if the recording of what we've done this evening could be circulated and disseminated right across the country. It would really uh, be in a very important step. And related to that, perhaps, I'm not sure, I've never, I, I, I'm excited about the new second level program, Credible Catholic, but I'm just wondering how, how is that going to reach, say, our state schools? And we have parents in there that are as committed as any other parents. Isn't there a gap there? Or is there any way of bridging that gap? Or, or is, it, is it going to be a parish program rather than a second level program? I'm only throwing out two silly questions. Well, it's 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 a program. It's up on um, CatholicSchools.ie under Credible Catholic. So all the program is there for anyone to to download, um, and there's there's kind of guides. So essentially, you could you, anyone could could do it. Um, they're they're essentially powerpoints, and you can just download them. So they were developed for for the Catholic uh, voluntary schools, secondary schools, but. There's nothing stopping people using them, you know. If I would say there, Alex, as well, um, the Credible Catholic program, it's not just about a program, it's about people, it's about people in this room. The best Credible Catholics are you and me. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I would say as well into Mary's question, if the cheese is good, the mice will come. <laughs> if the quality of the content is good, people will be drawn to it. And I, I think that's a, a key um, truth to hold on to because people are attracted to what's beautiful and what's true. And they're attracted to authenticity. And if they find us that in you and me, the faith will automatically and naturally become more credible. So just to thank Father Billy again for a wonderfully rich uh, presentation. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, our next, uh, our next seminar is going to be the end of March, uh, Wednesday, the 30th of March, at the same time, 7 o'clock. Um, our next speaker will be Siobhan O'Donoghue, um, the, the post-primary lead in Veritas, who's uh, an ORI teacher herself and was instrumental in developing the transition year program, Look Up, uh, which, is, which is out now. And Siobhan will talk to us on catechesis in the realm of young people, a religion teacher's perspective. Um, so the link for registration is going to be up on the catechetics.ie website uh, in, in webinars. You need to register uh, for, each, for each webinar. And uh, we look forward to, to seeing you then. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Alex, and thank you, Father Billy. Keep up the great work, everybody. It's an exciting and a wonderful time. So keep that before us, too. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thank Thanks, Father Billy. Thank